live webinar titled, Aplastic Anemia 101, Understanding the Basics. Thank you for joining us. My name is Cottrell Harris, and I'm the manager of learning events for the AA and MDS International Foundation, and I will be moderating this presentation today. As we get started, I would like to acknowledge Alexion Pharmaceuticals, Amgen, and Celgene Corporation for providing educational grants to help support this and other webinar education programs. We do have one other webinar this month titled MDS in Your Health Insurance on November the 15th. I do encourage you, if you're interested, to sign up via our website. Please visit our website for more information on webinars, conferences, and other learning events. Today's webinar will be archived on our online learning center within 7 to 10 business days. You will be notified when it is live and ready for viewing. Immediately following this presentation, there will be a question and answer session. Please feel free to submit questions at any time during the presentation by using the text chat window on the lower right-hand side of your screen. To submit a question or comment, type your question in the small text box just below the text chat window. When you have finished, hit enter. We will do our best to get to all questions. I do ask when asking questions to please submit your entire question all at the same time. Do not submit it in pieces or send additional information. We do receive many questions and will not be able to piece your question together from multiple submissions. Also, please provide the minimum amount of personal information you feel necessary to respond to your question. We want to answer as many questions as possible and keep your question brief, and keeping your question brief will help us do that. You will not be able to communicate with other users during the session via the chat window. We will be the only ones who can see the questions being asked. If you would like to connect with others, please visit our website for more information about our peer support network and Merrill forums. Immediately following this webinar, a post-event survey will pop up on your screen. Please take a few minutes to complete this brief survey because this will help us to improve our future webinars. Today's presenter is Dr. Michael Pulsifer. Dr. Pulsifer is the Medical Director of Pediatric Blood and Marrow Transplantation at Primary Children's Medical Center. In addition, Dr. Pulsifer is Professor of both Hematology and Pediatrics at the University of Utah School of Medicine and a member of the Imaging, Diagnostics, and Therapeutics Program at the Huntsman Cancer, Cent Cancer Institute. Dr. Pulsifer's work and research focus on transplantation of blood and of marrow in children with acute leukemias and marrow failure syndromes. He is particularly interested in developing safer methods of blood and bone marrow transplantation. Welcome, Dr. Pulsifer. Thank you very much. Again, as a reminder, you can submit your questions on the right-hand side of your screen at any time. At this time, I will turn the presentation over to Dr. Pulsifer. Thank you very much for your introduction. What I hope to accomplish today is to give a basic review of what to expect uh, when you get a diagnosis of aplastic anemia uh, and therapeutic options or things that you might want to choose for your treatment. Um, my goal in doing this is to not only educate you about aplastic anemia itself, but also to talk a little bit about uh, things that are not aplastic anemia because it's very important to make sure as you uh, get your diagnosis with aplastic anemia that it is the correct diagnosis because the correct diagnosis means uh, the correct therapy will, will be given. Um, the first thing to mention, of course, is uh, if you take a look at the slide here, um, there's a big difference uh, when you look at a bone marrow of a patient who has aplastic anemia compared to a normal bone marrow. To the left, you see lots of cells. These are cells under a microscope. The big white circles are fat uh, deposits that are found in marrow, more as you get a little bit older. Uh, the vast majority of people uh, who are anywhere between age 20 and 80 will have somewhere between uh, 40 to 60 percent of their uh, marrow space filled with cells and then the remainder will be filled with fat. As you can see on the right side of this slide, uh, this is a patient with aplastic anemia uh, where you see only the fat cells and very, very few cells. This shows very clearly uh, that there are really no cells within the bone marrow that are making the major constituents of bone marrow. Now, what are the most important things that occur 
The next slide here illustrates the bone marrow where it is located inside of the bones. Um, that bone marrow is in a microenvironment or a place where it's manufacturing key cells that keep you alive and keep you healthy. I'm going to point out a couple of specific cells on the right side of this particular illustration. You're going to see that um, you, you uh, develop a hematopoietic stem cell that is in the bone marrow, and from that, uh, there are many different types of what we call multi, multi-potential stem cells. These stem cells can go on to form what are called lymphocytes, uh, which make immune globulin and fight infection directly. Uh, you also form from your myeloid cells things called red cells, and all of us are acquainted with red cells. That's what makes your blood red. These are cells that take oxygen throughout your body and deliver it to the tissues. In addition to this, your blood contains platelets. Platelets um, peel off of a cell as small units uh, that uh, are used to form blood clots and improve your ability to uh, form a clot and not have significant bleeding. Um, in addition, there are what are called neutrophils and some other neutrophil-related cells, basophils, eosinophils, and monocytes. Neutrophils are uh, very important in fighting infection. Uh, they are uh, up front the cells that protect you uh, more than almost anything else. Um, your marrow, uh, its key, its most important mission is to deliver these cells through your body to fight infection, to keep you from bleeding, and deliver oxygen uh, to the tissues. Now, um, let me give you a, a specific case, a situation of an individual. Suppose we have a 55-year-old man uh, who uh, has excessive bruising. Um, he's worried about this, and he sees his local physician. Uh, more than your usual bruising, every time he bumps into something, he gets a large bruise, um, uh, and he's quite worried about it. His initial blood counts show that his platelets are low, and that's been contributing to his his uh, bruising. That platelet count is about 50,000. Uh, his ANC, and this is a term that I'll be using, his absolute neutrophil count is also low, 800. The normal should be several thousand. And his hematocrit is also low, 33. Normal hematocrits are usually for a male, somewhere between 36 and 46, depending on how high your altitude is. So this man clearly has a decrease in all of those cell lines. Uh, all of the different parts uh, that the bone marrow should be making are down. That man is then sent to a hematologist, and he has a bone marrow biopsy. Remember I mentioned to you that, that uh, the bone marrow that's severely affected and has aplastic anemia has more fat and fewer cells. In this case, cellularity is 30%. Um, tests are sent to make sure that there aren't any genetic abnormalities found in those cells that might show an early evidence of leukemia or myelodysplastic syndrome, and those are normal. So what do you do with this particular individual? This particular man uh, falls into a category of what we call non-severe aplastic anemia. Looking at this slide, uh, again, this case addresses the first question that we need to ask ourselves when we're, we're thinking about anemia. If your blood counts are down, the question is, do you need treatment? Do you need to have specific things given to you uh, in order to improve those counts? Well, the first judgment needs to be made, and that is, um, what is going to hurt you? Um, there are several things that do hurt you, and in general, when you have a number of different levels of your cells uh, that are to the point where you can be harmed by this, that becomes something we call severe aplastic anemia. Now, what defines then severe aplastic anemia? Two of the three main cell lines, the neutrophils, which again are really important fighters of infection, the platelets, um, the platelets, again, uh, keep you from bleeding. The reticulocytes are a very early red cell. That early red cell is something, uh, again, that shows whether or not you're making the red cells or the blood. At least two of those cell lines have to be down in order to call something severe aplastic anemia. In addition, that bone marrow has to have low cellularity, less than 25% or 
um, less than 30% uh, of hematopoietic cells if you have some other cells that are in the bone marrow. Now, um, uh, if these cell lines are down really very low with neutrophils less than 500, that means you're highly susceptible to infection. And these can be very severe infections, invasive fungal infection, um, severe bacterial infections, unusual infections that no normal healthy person would get. The platelets, if they're less than 20,000, that means you can have spontaneous bleeding where you'll have more than just a bruise. You can end up with bleeding in your brain, bleeding from your um, gastrointestinal tract, from your stomach or your colon, that can potentially be life-threatening. In addition, when you have very low reticulocytes, that means you're not making enough blood and your blood can drift down and that makes you very tired and not have enough oxygen carrying capacity. So just two out of these three uh, lines being down uh, to the degree that's mentioned here, uh, and that will mean uh, that that patient then has severe aplastic anemia. Almost everyone would agree that patients with severe aplastic anemia should be treated. There's another category that you can see at the bottom of this slide, and that's very severe aplastic anemia, and that's when the neutrophils are less than 200. Um, the only real distinction with very severe aplastic anemia means uh, is that there's more risk of potentially fatal complications up front while you're getting your therapy because uh, your risk of infection is very high. So now you've determined whether you're severe, you need to take a look at the next slide and go one step further. You need to make sure that it is aplastic anemia as opposed to something else. The other thing that it could potentially be uh, is a hereditary bone marrow failure syndrome. Now let's talk briefly about aplastic anemia, and I'll talk about it, of course, a lot more as far as the causes uh, in a few slides. Acquired aplastic anemia means that your bone marrow cells that make all the rest of your blood, which we call hematopoietic stem cells, have been knocked down. Now, almost always it's by an immune attack. I'm going to talk briefly about toxin exposures, but by far most people who have aplastic anemia have had an immune attack on their cells. And that's why we treat it with immune suppression. Now, on occasion, the attack is so severe that you may not have a chance to recover. Those patients for sure would need bone marrow transplant in order to replace the, the um, uh, completely damaged bone marrow. Uh, but um, patients um, uh, who have matched siblings and other uh, 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 opportunities sometimes will need a bone marrow transplant as well. We'll talk about that a little bit more. Uh, but there are another group of patients that it's important uh, to be aware of to make sure that you don't fall in that category because these particular individuals don't tend to respond to immune suppression or bone marrow transplant. These are patients who have hereditary bone marrow failure syndromes. And these syndromes are genetic disorders resulting in bone marrow uh, or single lineage failure. Okay, When I say single lineage, that means that you can have a bone marrow that is down uh, just with the platelets or a bone marrow that is down just with the red cells. Um, uh, now, these disorders also have what we call phenotypic abnormalities. And what that means is that they sometimes will have physical signs on uh, a, a physical exam that are associated with that bone marrow failure syndrome. In addition, many of these bone marrow failure syndromes, uh, it's important to understand them because they can go on to uh, develop leukemia at a much higher rate. Now, what are the bone marrow failure syndromes? There's a list included here, Fanconi anemia, Schwachmann-Diamond syndrome, dyskeratosis congenita, amegacaryocytic thrombocytopenia, lots of long names of these different things. Um, the most important thing to understand about these syndromes uh, are that um, you, you want your physician to be familiar with them and to think about them uh, as he's diagnosing you um, so that uh, it's not overlooked. Now, I want to show you just one slide here. Uh, there are a lot of things to consider and look at for bone marrow failure syndromes, but I think that there are a few key issues to keep in mind. The first thing is that uh, patients who are short uh, or who have unusual skin or bone findings really should be carefully looked at to make sure that you don't have a bone marrow failure syndrome. Um, 
radial anomalies that you can see as this first, uh, uh, as one of the things on this slide, those are abnormalities associated with your wrist or hands, and those can be associated with Fanconi anemia. Um, metaphyseal chondrodysplasia is a bone abnormality of your femur and a narrow chest. Uh, these abnormalities are associated with Schwachmann diamond. Um, many patients will have skin changes. Um, there is something called a cafe au lait spot, which is like a brown spot that you can see right here in the middle on the right side. There's a brown spot on this patient's back. That cafe au lait spot uh, is associated with Fanconi anemia and also can be associated um, with uh, uh, dyskeratosis, um, uh, excuse me, with Fanconi anemia uh, and uh, changes darkness in the uh, in the chest and uh, uh, other areas can be associated with dyskeratosis uh, uh, congenita. As you can see, looking down this list, there are a number of different things, abnormalities with your eyes or your e ears, uh, problems with your mouth, um, head uh, shape a little bit off. These things can be associated with marrow failure syndrome. Syndromes. In addition to this, unusual cancers, cancers occurring very young or people having more than one cancer, those can be associated with marrow failure syndrome. So if any of these symptoms exist, then you need to be very um, careful about making sure that you're not just only thinking it's aplastic anemia because it can be uh, bone marrow failure associated with one of these inherited bone marrow failure syndromes. So now let's assume uh, that we have a new patient coming who has bone marrow failure. All of these blood counts are down. The bone marrow is not working very well. We've done a bone marrow test, and it looks like the bone marrow has low cellularity. The first thing we do is we ask about toxic exposures. There are a number of chemicals and medications that uh, patients can take that can be associated with bone marrow failure. Uh, many of these are temporary uh, and patients can recover from them. So it's important to, for your physician to take a good history about medications that you might have taken uh, or about whether you have worked with chemicals or been exposed to chemicals such as benzene, which may affect your marrow function. In addition, your doctor will generally review for a history of any infections. The most common association uh, with aplastic anemia is hepatitis, which is an infection of the liver. Um, so it's important to know about recent infections. Pregnancy has been clearly associated with aplastic anemia. Um, when women are pregnant, they uh, oftentimes have autoimmune disorders that can occur, and um, so it's very important, of course, uh, if you uh, have uh, pregnancy to understand that, that aplastic anemia can be associated with that. In addition, uh, you want to know, as I mentioned previously, whether there's any history in the family of cancer, unusual cancers, or if there's any history in the, in the family of people who died young of unusual infections or people who had known bone marrow failure syndrome. So those are some things that you should know early on. Now here, uh, this slide shows a number of medications that can be associated with bone marrow failure. There are a few antibiotics. Uh, chloramphenicol is the most famous of these antibiotics. We hardly ever use this anymore. About 1 in 50,000 individuals who use chloramphenicol would have bone marrow failure syndrome. It's really been replaced because of this rare side effect by other newer medications. But many of the other medications, the sulfonamides, linazolid, um, uh, septra or co cotrimoxazole, this, these particular antibiotics are used very frequently, so it's important to, to know whether you're on antibiotics. There are a number of anti-inflammatory agents, anticonvulsants. It's very common to see patients who are on phenytoin, which is dilantin, uh, or carbamazepine uh, to have uh, temporary bone marrow failure. And again, it's, it's this bone marrow failure from these agents are, are reversible. And other medicines that you can see uh, below can as well. Uh, cause um, uh, bone marrow dysfunction. Other issues, toxins. Uh, benzene, as I mentioned before, has been very clearly associated with marrow failure. Um, most of the other toxins, uh, it's a little bit unclear. Um, pesticides have been sometimes associated with it. DDT, um, uh, there have been some very unusual exposures. Uh, 
such as um, animal fertilizer. Um, on occasion, uh, uh, recreational drugs have been associated with it. It's hard to say just how often uh, these um, uh, things occur, but, uh, but one should keep that in mind as they're looking it up. This next slide really shows what's behind by far the largest majority of patients who have aplastic anemia. As you can see here, um, uh, this is uh, uh, a T cell, and T cells uh, are cells in your body that are very potent in causing immune reactions. And what happens is um, an abnormal interaction occurs uh, between an antigen-presenting cell and a T cell. Um, the antigen-presenting cell is what teaches the T cell what to attack. The T cell uh, expands, gets a clonal expansion, and so now you have a whole bunch of these T cells, and now they begin attacking your own hematopoietic stem and progenitor cells. And that leads to death, cell death, apoptosis, uh, and now you have aplastic anemia because your bone marrow stem cells are being damaged by your own T cells. Now, second case study. We have a 14-year-old girl who has severe plastic anemia. Her neutrophil count is very low uh, at uh, 200, an ANC of 200. Um, that uh, then requires platelet transfusion. She, she requires platelet transfusions. Um, so now you see two cell lines are down. Um, so she's at very high risk and would be classified as severe. Um, she has three sibling, siblings. Um, she has fever and signs of infection. So what, what should we do in her situation? Well, first step we need to do is make an initial therapeutic decision. As I mentioned to you before, the gentleman in his mid-50s who had counts that were down somewhat wasn't at a situation where his counts were so low that he would be in peril. Uh, he could live with bruising uh, and not have a lot of problems. Uh, and not really need a lot of decision. So those patients who have non-severe aplastic anemia and are not transfusion dependent oftentimes will watch and wait. Um, those who become transfusion dependent because transfusions can cause problems, red cells can give you iron overload and platelets uh, can make you platelet resistant such that you'll get to a point where you will no longer respond to them and will have problems with bleeding. So whenever someone becomes transfusion dependent, that's the time to consider uh, treatment with immune suppression. Now, if you have very severe aplastic anemia uh, and you're younger, most uh, of our outlines uh, recommend that patients uh, be assessed to see if they have an HLA identical sibling donor. And if they have a sibling donor, uh, they go to bone marrow transplant. If they don't have a sibling donor, uh, then they're treated with ATG and cyclosporine. Now, this is uh, what most uh, people uh, recommend for initial treatment, and I'll tell you in great detail why um, these recommendations uh, are moved forward. Uh, this particular slide I need to explain. Um, what happens here is this is a study that was done in uh, young children in Europe, and the top line that you can see is uh, a 90% uh, long-term disease-free survival. This is out, uh, uh, you know, 15 years, uh, and these patients are doing great without major issues. Um, uh, and uh, again, as you can see, about 90% uh, of them have long-term disease-free survival. We do even better than that nowadays. Um, well, uh, what this comparison shows is that if you wait with your initial treatment and first get immune suppression uh, and then go to transplant later if you've failed immune suppression, uh, then you tend to do worse, uh, about 70% survival. Um, it's important uh, if you have a matched sibling and you have a good transplant center uh, for you to consider moving ahead with transplant early. We used to say get them in a transplant room within one to two weeks. Um, that's not quite as important. The most important thing is that you uh, have infections under control uh, and you get to a transplant as soon as you reasonably can. I still prefer that patients go uh, fairly quickly. But matched sibling transplantation, if you have a sibling, uh, is the best way forward. What I want to do is talk a little bit about sibling transplant, and then I want to talk about immune suppression. There are four keys that you see here uh, to success with matched sibling transplant. So if you're going to have these, um, have a matched sibling transplant, ask your doctor about these things. 
The first thing is don't wait, and I'll show you a little bit data on that. Uh, you don't want to wait around a few months. You want to just move forward fairly quickly. The second thing is bone marrow is best. There, is, there are two ways to harvest bone marrow stem cells from a patient. One is bone marrow, and the other is something called peripheral blood stem cells. Peripheral blood stem cells lead to more graft-versus-host disease, a complication of bone marrow transplant, and so it's better to use bone marrow. Um, for a while, people were using peripheral blood stem cells because they are easier, but recent data has shown very clearly that using bone marrow is much safer for you uh, as you go through your transplant. The third thing is um, ATG used in association with the transplant decreases risks of graft-versus-host disease and leads to better outcome. There's an alternative to that, a medicine called CAMPATH, which is an antibody against a protein on the surface of white cells called CD52, and you can use either one. Uh, you just have to be good at it, uh, uh, but either one will help you through your transplant have a better outcome. And the final thing, age is a high price to pay for maturity. Uh, those of you who've paid that price, uh, uh, unfortunately, the older you are, the less likely a sibling transplant is to have a good outcome. You get fabulous outcomes up until about age 40, but above age 40, uh, your outcomes are a little bit worse. Your outcomes with uh, immune suppression are a little bit worse, too, um, and I'll illustrate that. These are the keys to success. The slide that I have here is a bit of a confusing slide. Let me explain. Um, if you look on the third column, you see something called uh, P. Uh, P values that are more than point, that are less than 0 0.05 means that something is important. Uh, and so, uh, what this is illustrating is in a big study uh, that was published a few years ago, the most important things to good outcome: the younger you are, the better; the earlier you get your transplant, having ATG in your conditioning regimen. Uh, using a standard conditioning regimen that has cyclophosphamide at a dose of 200 milligrams and using bone marrow. Those things have all been shown to be really, really important uh, for outcomes, and I'll illustrate that further. Uh, this is an outline of graft-versus-host disease and shows why we like bone marrow rather than peripheral blood stem cells. Um, the first couple of bars um, show uh, percentages of patients uh, who have um, acute graft-versus-host disease um, and uh, percentages of patients who have very severe acute graft-versus-host disease. The next uh, are percentage, the, uh, the third set of bars and the fourth set of bars are those who have severe uh, chronic graft-versus-host, excuse me, any chronic graft-versus-host disease and severe chronic graft-versus-host disease. Now, the important thing to see here uh, is that you have half a, the rate of any graft-versus-host disease uh, if you use bone marrow rather than peripheral blood stem cells. So it's very important, again, as I mentioned, to use bone marrow. This particular slide shows a combination of things. As you can see, you get an advantage with better outcomes. These lines show survival curves, 84%, 87%, 84%, 80%. 80 um, uh, these show that if you have early transplant and are, real, are a little bit younger, have ATG in your conditioning regimen, those are all good things and help you have uh, a better outcome. So what does this all lead to? Well, if you have uh, patients who are treated the right way uh, with bone marrow and um, have, don't have any negative predictive factors, uh, then survival can be very high, as you can see here uh, on the right-hand column on the upper part, uh, greater than 90%. And as mentioned, for matched sibling transplantation in many modern programs, uh, uh, it's greater than 95%. Let's look at another case study. We have a 54-year-old woman who has severe aplastic anemia. Uh, her neutrophil count is 200. She requires platelet transfusions. Um, so again, with two lines down, she is severe. She has three siblings, uh, fever and signs of infection. Now, should you do a transplant on her if one of her siblings is a match? We have a little bit of data uh, published from uh, transplants that have been performed on patients who are over age 40. Uh, 
Uh, and what you see is that as opposed to rates of severe chronic graft versus host disease of 4% that I showed you on the last slide, uh, there's more in patients that are older. In addition, there's more acute graft versus host disease in the range of 40%. Uh, so with more graft versus host disease in older patients, you tend to do not quite as well. Uh, this particular sl slide illustrates uh, that patients um, who were on average about 50 years old um, uh, tended to um, uh, survive, uh, have long-term survival about 60% of the time, 65% of the time. Um, because uh, a number of those patients could respond to immune suppression and not have that 30 to 35% risk of, of a fatal uh, complication, almost always we would recommend upfront immune suppressive therapy for these older patients, even if they do have a sibling. And then if they fail their immune suppression, they would go to transplant. Many of the patients uh, uh, doing it that way can uh, be safer. Here's another case for you to look at. You have a 35-year-old male who has severe plastic anemia. He has an ANC of zero. He needs both platelet and red cell transfusion, so he falls into the very severe category. He has no siblings or his siblings are not available. So this patient clearly, without even thinking, needs to have intense therapy with immune suppression. Um, ATG uh, and cyclosporin have been shown very carefully to be the correct therapy. Now, how about a comparison of horse versus rabbit ATG? Um, there are two types of ATG products available in the United States right now. Um, the first is horse, uh, the second rabbit ATG. Um, they are very different products in that the rabbit ATG is longer lasting. It's a little bit more potent. Um, as you can see here from a study that was performed by Neil Young's group at the NIH, um, Patients who are treated with immune suppressive therapy have an approximately 60 to 70% chance of having some response when uh, you get out to about um, uh, six months. Um, the majority of them, the vast majority of them, will respond in the first three months. This randomized controlled trial uh, showed that HORSE uh, led to twice the number of respondents uh, with a 33% uh, response compared to a 62% response at three months and a 37% response compared to a 68% response at six months. It's clear right now that with current methods of treating immune, uh, uh, immune suppression with cyclosporin and ATG, it's better to get horse ATG. Now, uh, why is horse better? It's hard to say for sure. This illustrates, this next slide illustrates, that uh, patients get lymphocyte counts improving very rapidly. Uh, the blue line shows that even within a few days, uh, patients are improving their counts, um, uh, meaning that the rabbit ATG is just much more intense and really knocks your lymphocyte counts down. It could be that the rabbit ATG at lower doses uh, may be uh, more reasonable, but that has yet, yet to be tested. So the bottom line here is that um, currently uh, in the United States, based on the Neil Young study, um, uh, it's uh, most appropriate to use uh, horse ATG for the first uh, treatment. Um, horse ATG not only led to better um, uh, upfront uh, um, uh, response, uh, it also led to better survival. Uh, this is a group of patients um, where uh, if you had a transplant, you were taken off. Usually it's the patients who fail who are taken off, uh, so these patients tend to do very well. Uh, so, But even in the, that circumstance, the horse uh, patients survive more often than those with rabbit ATG. Uh, if you had those who had to undergo transplant because they failed, and some of those, of course, will be very sick by the time they get to transplant, there's, there's an even bigger advantage uh, for horse ATG compared to rabbit ATG. All right. Now, this slide illustrates some late effects that we always need to think about very carefully if we're going to go to transplant. Uh, excuse me, if you have aplastic anemia. Late effect number one to be concerned about is second malignancies. As you can see in the left upper column, uh, this shows that second cancers can occur um, over time. Uh, myelodysplastic syndrome and PNH in the lower right-hand column uh, occur when you get uh, ATG and cyclosporin. Uh, 
Uh, about 10% of patients will develop PNH, and about 11% will develop myelodysplastic syndrome, which will eventually go on to leukemia. Um, in addition, a fair percentage, about a third of patients, may relapse at some point. Uh, so even if you do respond to your initial immune suppression, you're not totally out of the clear, uh, uh, totally in the clear. Uh, you need to um, uh, be very aware that uh, uh, a certain percentage of patients will need more treatment uh, and more things done. So what do you do uh, if you fail immune suppression? Well, um, the, the question then is... Um, uh, how do you monitor failing, and what are good ways to move forward? Okay, so first is to check your response at four months. Now, the reason why we say at about four months is because, uh, as you saw from uh, the uh, data that I shared about rabbit versus hor horse ATG, the vast number of uh, patients who re respond will respond within the first three months. And, and more will respond between uh, four months and six months, uh, but almost all of them who are going to respond will respond in the first three months. So in general, uh, uh, we like to assess at three months, and if your patient is not responding, then you'll look for an unrelated donor. If you happen to find a completely matched unrelated donor or you haven't had an initial transplant and haven't responded at four months, uh, then it's time to move forward with your matched unrelated donor or your sibling transplant, and your outcomes can be very good with that. The other alternative would be a second course of ATG. Um, the most published is giving rabbit after you've failed with your horse. Um, uh, CAMPATH has been used, uh, and there are many experimental protocols that are designed to treat these patients uh, that way as well. Um, but bottom line here is if you don't respond, uh, within four to six months, your likelihood of, of uh, long-term survival is markedly decreased, and a transplant uh, is, should be considered uh, or alternative therapies. Now, there have been a few things recently over the last, four, uh, last five to ten years that, have, uh, that we've been trying to use to predict outcomes with immune suppression. Um, one of them is absolute reticulocyte count. That's the number of very early red cells that are being produced. And the other is telomere length. Telomeres are um, uh, the ends of your chromosomes. Um, if you recall, all of us have chromosomes, uh, our genes, and at the very end of these very long DNA strands are telomeres. If you have very short telomeres, you tend to have it do a little bit worse. Uh, this is a survival curve from a study that was done at the NIH, uh, which showed that patients with very low absolute reticulocyte count, reticulocyte count and short telomeres at diagnosis uh, tended to respond very poorly. Now, why did they have a poor survival? Um, there were a number of reasons. Patients with low telomeres had a higher chance of going on uh, to develop myelodysplastic syndrome or to uh, develop uh, uh, abnormal cytogenetics, which were pre-leukemia. In addition, um, they tended to relapse more. So they responded about the same, but as you can see, um, the uh, uh, patients who had the very shortest telomeres respond, uh, relapsed more than 50% of the time. Um, so those patients simply are at higher risk for relapse and higher risk for other bad things happening. And that's why, as you can see in this slide, uh, their survival was much worse uh, over time when they had very short telomeres. Now, not every physician is measuring telomeres because uh, we don't have uh, ways yet of uh, you know, making your telomeres better. Uh, but uh, uh, that is something that may help predict how you're going to do. Here's another case. We have a 28-year-old woman who responded initially to cyclosporine and ATG. While she was tapering her cyclosporine counts, uh, while, while she was tapering her cyclosporine, her blood counts fell. All of a sudden, now she's neutropenic again, and she's starting to require red cell transfusions and, excuse me, platelet transfusions. Um, what should you do for this individual? Well, very often these type of individuals can respond to going back up on their immune suppression. And a certain percentage of patients who have aplastic anemia will become cyclosporine dependent and may need to have cyclosporine for an extended period of time. Um, this particular uh, outline uh, shows um, 
basically how to uh, respond if you relapse. Um, this outline is uh, found in an article that was published by Phil Scheinberg a short while ago in the journal Blood, um, How I Treat Aplastic Anemia. Uh, essentially, if you relapse, um, the recommendation was more immune suppression, um, cyclosporin, uh, rabbit ATG plus cyclosporin, or uh, alemtuzumab, which is CAMPATH. Um, each one of these particular treatments uh, can have a reasonable response. There's no clear data to show which the best is. Um, if you have response, then you can continue uh, with your immune suppression for a more extended period of time. If you don't have a response, however, then it's time to go on to considering bone marrow transplant. Um, and if you don't have a response, especially even to a second uh, generation uh, uh, therapy uh, or experimental protocols, um, then an alternative donor transplant would be appropriate. And I'm going to talk a little bit about alternative donor transplant. On the right-hand side of the slide, you'll see what our recommendations are with clonal evolution. Um, uh, patients who have clonal evolution and go on to have myelodysplastic syndrome uh, need to be treated um, in, a, in an entirely different way. Many of them will require bone marrow transplantation. Now, here's another case. You have a 16-year-old girl with severe plastic anemia. She has no siblings, and she's treated with standard horse ATG and cyclosporin. Four months later, still transfusion-dependent red cells, platelets, and ANC of 100. So she has completely failed uh, her initial induction. So she needs an unrelated donor bone marrow transplant, as I've mentioned, if we can find an appropriate match for her. Now, I've listed here again. Uh, uh, possible times when an unrelated donor bone marrow transplant might be considered. Uh, most would agree that initial failure of immune suppression is a good time to consider unrelated donor transplant. Um, failure of two attempts at immune suppression with any donor is a, is a nice is another time, uh, and that's uh, basically if you have someone who responds and then uh, relapses and uh, gets another attempt and fails. Um, uh, it, it's it's difficult to know for sure um, if someone has responded to a second uh, or a third course of immune suppression when to consider transplant. Uh, but bottom line is, if if they uh, have failed, uh, then it's easier to consider transplant. One thing that uh, is under consideration is if you fail, uh, uh, um, if you have uh, short telomeres. Um, maybe those patients should be transplanted earlier, but we do we simply don't know whether that's the right thing to do or not at this point. Now, just as I mentioned with related donor uh, transplantation, unrelated donor transplantation um, has some real keys. Now, it's very important to understand that unrelated donor transplantation has become markedly better in the last decade. Um, about 10 years ago, survival rates were uh, in the 40 to 50 percent range. They are now incredibly higher. They're greater than 80 percent uh, when you have matched unrelated donors. And so it's, much, uh, it's a much better treatment now, and um, many people are opting for it uh, when they know they're simply not going to do well long term with uh, continued supportive care and um, immune suppression. Um, here are the key issues. Bone marrow is the best source. New approaches, reduced intensity approaches have increased survival significantly. If you're going to have an unrelated donor transplant, you do better if you're transplanted early and you haven't had years and years of transfusions and infectious related complications. Um, and the final thing that I'll talk briefly about is that, that alternative donors or mismatched donors and haploidentical or half-matched donors and cord bloods um, have worse outcomes, but there are some promising uh, studies that show that we may be getting better over time. This particular study uh, was an interesting study that shows uh, that um, you need to be careful about looking at only survival curves. You need to know what's underneath them. This is a study of young patients um, who failed immune suppression. Um, and I'm going to skip a couple of slides here to show you this outcome. Now, um, if you look just at the bottom, uh, what you will see is that uh, overall in failure-free survival between getting a transplant and not getting a transplant was the same. Um, in other words, nowadays we can keep people alive for a fair amount of time uh, just getting blood transfusions, 
Um, but unfortunately, these patients needed one therapy after another, uh, and uh, they were kind of uh, uh, involved very extensively in the medical system. Um, however, uh, if the, the patients got a transplant, um, uh, they uh, uh, had an overall survival that was incredibly high. Uh, in Section B, you can see these are the transplanted patients. Uh, they had an overall survival and fa failure-free survival that was great. They are off their immune suppression. They're living normal lives. Uh, they're really, really doing well, as opposed to these patients who have failed their immune suppression because they failed it to begin with, and now their second and third and subsequent treatments uh, are running into trouble. They were able to keep them alive, uh, but they've had to have one treatment after another. So for very young patients, um, uh, one needs to keep that in mind, that a, a transplant uh, uh, with an unrelated donor uh, can be given in such a way that fertility can be preserved, and the vast majority of them don't get graft-versus-host disease, um, and, uh, and they become independent of the uh, uh, medical uh, community much sooner. Now, the next slide here... Um, Actually, I'm going to skip that because we already talked about it. These are data from the Center for International Blood Marrow Transplant uh, that shows outcome. Now, the trouble with this data is that uh, there was a huge leap of improved outcomes that took place after 2004, and this includes data that was from before 2004 as well. Um, and as you can see, matched survival of unrelated donors in the 80% range. This includes a lot of patients who were old and very sick and had lots of problems. A mismatch was more like 60%. Uh, these outcomes, uh, if you only include from 2005 uh, to the present, uh, are much better, um, each of them probably 5 to 10% uh, higher. So there's been some real improvement. The big worry that we still have with bone marrow is that um, uh, graft-versus-host disease can occur a little more often in the range of 20 to 25 percent, uh, and chronic graft-versus-host disease is no fun. It requires immune suppression uh, for several years, so um, you trade one disease for another, but at least you're not getting chronic transfusions, um, and, and you will eventually be completely off immune suppression, so that's an important thing to consider. Now, a couple things to learn. As I mentioned, after 2004, outcomes are much better with unrelated donors. As you can see, survival exceeding 80%. Um, if you're transplanted within two years, survival was close to 90% uh, for unrelated donor transplant. Um, what's the best approach? A combination of fludarabine, cyclophosphamide, uh, ATG, and very low dose to total body irradiation now appears to be the very best approach. There's a big study ongoing in the bone marrow transplant clinical trials network trying to decide what the best dose of cyclophosphamide is. We think it might be in the either 50 or 100, and we're we're working on that. Now, how about if if a patient uh, fails immune suppression multiple times and has no other alternative? Um, what do we have to offer uh, if they don't have a good match? And I'm going to talk about why they might not have a good match. Um, uh, they could have what we call half matches or haploidentical uh, donors. Or we could do a cord blood. And cord bloods, we don't have to match quite as carefully as unrelated donors. Um, uh, there are some that are under development. Let's look at this in more detail. Here's the challenge. Eight of eight is what we want if we want a regular un unrelated bone marrow. And, this, and whether or not you're going to have uh, an eight of eight is it kind of depends on your background. As you can see here, eight of eight happens in about 70% of Caucasians. Um, that's because there's not a lot of inter, um, uh, marriage between different groups. Um, so the alleles are fairly common in Caucasians. Um, and you have about a 70% chance of a, of a match, whereas the genetic diversity is much higher in African Americans, so there's only a 20% chance that you'll have a complete match. If you allow a single mismatch, and remember you get more graft-versus-host disease and worse survival, then you can get above 90 in, in Caucasians, but still only about 60% uh, or so of African Americans uh, can be considered in that particular blend. Um, so can you offer more? If you are able to uh, allow a cord, a single cord for pediatrics, and allow some mismatches, more than 90% of patients can uh, find a donor. If you um, have an adult who's bigger, you have to use two cords. Uh, but um, even in African Americans, you can find uh, two cords that are well enough matched to move forward. 
uh, in about 80% of patients. So cord blood could be a very good way to move forward um, uh, if we can figure out the better ways to do it. Here's the trouble. This slide shows that um, large registry retrospective um, assessments uh, have uh, five years ago, five, ten years ago, shown about only a 40 to 50 percent chance of survival in uh, cord blood transplants. Um, a recent study done by uh, uh, investigators associated with the Pediatric Blood Marrow Transplant Consortium showed about an 80 percent survival, um, and this has been extended, and several small groups have shown, because over time they figured out better approaches, um, that you can approach 80% survival in patients uh, who are getting cord blood transplants, um, but more study needs to be done. Uh, one small Japanese cohort here using uh, an innovative approach uh, again showed an 80% survival. There's another group uh, that is uh, at the NHI, excuse me, NIH, that's using a combination of half-matched uh, uh, to get counts up very quickly plus cord blood. Uh, and what they're showing uh, using this particular uh, uh, approach, again, using cyclophosphamide, fludarabine, uh, low-dose uh, total body irradiation, and ATG, um, that uh, they can have uh, overall survivals in the 80 to 90 percent range. So there are some promising uh, things coming up, but as you can see, only small numbers, and we'd like to have more numbers. Now, what's, uh, what's the future focus of uh, bone marrow transplant and immune suppression therapies? Uh, what, what should we be looking for? Um, for bone marrow transplant, we need to decrease graft-versus-host disease. As I mentioned to you, it, it occurs with siblings in less than 10% um, with unrelated donors in the 20 uh, to 30%. Um, it's, it's a disease that we'd like to be 0%. So uh, uh, there are a lot of different things that people are trying to do to, to decrease graft-versus-host disease. We hope to improve alternative sources and work out and get more numbers in cord and haplocord approaches uh, to be able to offer bone marrow transplant to all those who need it. Um, in addition, we want patients to recover good immune reconstitution so they can be healthy and happy very quickly after a bone marrow transplant. Now, for, bone, for immune suppressive approaches, um, as I mentioned to you, some approaches have been too intense. We have to find a way to balance immune suppression. It may be that immune suppression simply won't work on a certain percentage of patients because their bone marrow stem cells have been completely depleted. In that circumstance, what we want to do is find agents that can restore stem cells, and that's what we're hoping uh, is coming forward with agents like Ultrombopag, um, although that in and of itself also needs to be, uh, uh, to be proven. So uh, in summary, uh, there's a nice little outline here of how we believe patients with aplastic anemia should be treated. Uh, as mentioned, first they need to be diagnosed properly. Uh, if they have a SIB uh, and they're on the young side, then sibling transplantation has a great outcome. They have uh, normal fertility, uh, very few late effects, and they do very nicely. Uh, if patients uh, are older or they don't have a sibling, uh, then uh, ATG plus cyclosporin, and it needs to be horse ATG. Um, if patients respond, uh, then um, now this particular outline says stop cyclosporin. Many uh, uh, would actually give cyclosporin for a year and then taper slowly. Um, that's a bit of a practice difference uh, that should be respected because we don't know clearly uh, what the best way is. Uh, patients who don't have response, uh, if they have good, a good match, uh, should go to unrelated donor transplantation. Uh, if they don't, then another round of, uh, of immune suppression or experimental therapies uh, can get them uh, very nicely uh, treated uh, and uh, <coughs> hopefully responding. Uh, if they fail multiple rounds of immune suppression, then alternative donor transplantation uh, should be considered. So I'd like to briefly acknowledge I have a large number of individuals that I work with through the Bone Marrow Transplant Clinical Trials Network um, uh, running some, uh, some trials. Uh, I work with a bone marrow failure syndrome group. I work with Neil Young's group at the NIH. Uh, there's a large group in Europe. Uh, there's a great group in Cleveland who works with us in the Japanese uh, aplastic anemia group, and I appreciate um, their collaboration uh, uh, in uh, helping me with my studies with aplastic anemia patients. And I'd be happy to answer questions. Thank you so very much, Dr. Pulsifer. We do have several questions that came in during the course. 
of your presentation. The first question is, is it common to have multiple treatments of ATG? Uh, it is something that many physicians will do. Uh, and one of the things that it's important to understand is that uh, oftentimes hematologists who are treating aplastic anemia uh, may not either be familiar or comfortable with bone marrow transplant um, or they may not uh, be near a center where people can at least consider and hear options about bone marrow transplant. Um, so many people will be treated with ATG and fail. At that point, if you failed um, initially, I would strongly agree that uh, m if you have a really good unrelated donor or a sibling donor, you should definitely do a transplant. But um, many uh, physicians, again, will give a second course. So it's something that occurs fairly commonly, um, and, uh, uh, and it also will occur commonly if, say, you respond initially to ATG and cyclosporin, and then as you're weaning off or a couple years later you have it come back again, many people uh, won't respond to only increasing your cyclosporin, sometimes they'll need ATG in addition, and so having a second or subsequent course uh, is certainly reasonable and, and it occurs fairly frequently. What would you say is the typical response time to ATG treatments? Uh, to ATG treatments in general or? It, just ATG treatment in general. Sure. So um, here's the way that, uh, that I would think of this. For initial diagnosed patients who have aplastic anemia, um, uh, who have, you've got to distinguish, very severe aplastic anemia, um, if you use horse ATG, approximately 60 to 70 percent of patients will respond. Now, if it's a child, there is probably a higher percentage of response. It may even exceed 80 percent, and that's been demonstrated in some European studies. Um, that's with horse ATG. Now, rabbit ATG uh, has done a little bit worse than that, as I've mentioned. That's for patients with newly diagnosed severe aplastic anemia. If you have non-severe, but yet you're transfusion dependent. Most uh, experts agree that more of those patients will respond to ATG. They simply have more marrow available. Um, their stem cells probably haven't been severely damaged, so more of them will respond. Now, if you failed to respond to your initial ATG and get a second treatment with ATG, then only about 30% of those individuals will respond. Uh, so um, that's a, a high-risk category, and that's where, again, I would say if you have a really good donor, you consider doing a transplant. Um, generally, that data that shows a 30% response rate for second course after first failure um, uh, has been with rabbit ATG when horse ATG was the first ATG given. Um, so if you get two horses in a row, there's no good data to say. <laughs> Um, but that's th these are generally some numbers uh, with both initial response and then response after you've failed. Um, if patients are tapering cyclosporin and then they have a relapse and they need to have more cyclosporin and another course of ATG, then the response rate is probably 50-50, somewhere in that ballpark. If I could segue from your answer to another question, if horse ATG is better, why does Europe use only the rabbit? It seems that success rates will be worse in Europe. Is that a reasonable conclusion? Well, here's what happened. Um, uh, we uh, There were horse ATG um, brands that were available in Europe. Uh, and were used until uh, approximately four years ago, somewhere in that ballpark. And um, then uh, because the only product that was available was a rabbit product, um, uh, that started being used um, more significantly. Um, uh, at the same time, uh, there was a large study in the United States comparing horse versus rabbit. And that study, uh, when it was published, eventually um, made the Europeans really carefully look at what had happened since they lost the horse ATG. And a recent um, review from the European group showed the same thing, that during the period where they had to use only rabbit, um, they did do worse um, than they had done when they had a horse-based product. 
And so a couple of things are going on to address that. One is they're getting expedited approval to use a horse-based product uh, in Europe. Uh, and um, uh, different dosing schemes for rabbit are also being tested just to see if it's just a, a, a dose issue and maybe people are giving too much uh, rabbit and hence causing bone marrow damage. Uh, but uh, for this brief period of time, um, uh, you know, when only rabbit could be used, um, uh, it appears that the Europeans did do a, a little bit worse. Um, rabbit also was being used in many other parts of the uh, world. Whether um, response, you know, the, the uh, data in the United States and the data in Europe uh, is with a population of the, the majority of whom are Northern Europeans, um, it may be that other populations um, uh, may be different as far as rabbit versus horse. Um, there was one study uh, with a Brazilian population that showed that rabbit appeared to be worse than horse. Um, other studies uh, that have been done in other areas, a few in Japan, haven't shown that necessarily it's it's that much worse. So there's still more studies that need to be needs to be done. But in in the United States, for sure, uh, and now in most parts of Europe, people are trying to use horse. Thank you. The next question is from a person who's 41 years old. They came down with aplastic anemia in 1987, received ATG, and have counts, and their counts have been fine for 25 years. Do you have an expected life? Do you have any any expected lifespan numbers for this type of patient, or or are there things they can do to stay in remission? Uh, well, if they've been in remission this long, they probably are fully recovered. Uh, the patients who have initial aplastic anemia and then go on to recover uh, have done extraordinarily well. Um, most uh, patients who um, have uh, gone on to have uh, myelodysplastic syndrome have tended to be patients who didn't respond all that well or who might have, inter uh, who might have relapsed once and have gotten extra courses of ATG. Um, but patients who have done as well as the 41-year-old um, uh, tend to live a full, long life with no specific um, long-term issues. Uh, they still should be followed to make sure that they don't develop myelodysplasia long-term. Um, uh, the things that I would recommend would be to uh, have a good, healthy diet and an active lifestyle. All those things will contribute to a better immune system um, and hopefully uh, prevent any relapse. But um, uh, I'm very optimistic that this uh, patient will hopefully have a long and healthy life. Thank you, Dr. Pulsifer. Are there any exciting treatments on the horizon, such as l -trombopag? l -trombopag is a very intriguing treatment. Uh, just to give people on the call some background about l um, this is uh, a drug that was originally uh, marketed to help production of platelets for patients who have um, immune disorders that have decreased their platelet production. Um, one important thing that was found out about it is that it is um, a protein that's naturally found in your body that, that um, enhances uh, the growth and support of uh, bone marrow stem cells. Um, and uh, therefore, its use in aplastic anemia, um, when it was originally tried out, was to try to uh, not only get a response, um, but to potentially um, uh, enhance the number of bone marrow stem cells. As I had mentioned earlier in this lecture, um, patients who have uh, very little bone marrow stem cells left because they've had an autoimmune disease that's totally wiped them out or unlikely to respond to immune suppressive therapy. And it sure would be nice if you have a very limited number of stem cells to have something that could nurture those stem cells and make them grow and expand. Um, the study that was published um, uh, by the NIH group uh, showed uh, that in very resistant uh, patients uh, with aplastic anemia, uh, they appeared to have more cellularity in their marrows and a response that um, uh, might mean that this is actually improving their bone marrow function um, and increasing their number of stem cells. So if that's the case, uh, then that is very exciting. And um, uh, we hope that that will be the case. Now, that said, there have been a number of agents who have looked the same uh, in the past, but when tested up front, uh, 
didn't go on to show anything uh, promising. So what we need to do is carefully do studies with l thrombopag to see if it can uh, not only help patients who failed immune suppression respond, but also those who are initially diagnosed with aplastic anemia, we hope that more of them will respond because when only 60 to 70 percent of them respond to immune suppression, we've still got a lot of work to do. Are there any early signs of aplastic anemia? So um, the one thing with aplastic anemia that's challenging uh, is that uh, often uh, you don't feel symptoms until it's quite far advanced. Um, the symptoms that people feel are fatigue, they see bruises, and they have unusual infections. Now, one thing that's unusual, uh, or one thing that's actually uh, good about the body is that uh, you don't really have significant bleeding until your platelets are way down. Uh, you might have a, an unusual bruising below 50 if you if you bump into something, but you won't have spontaneous bleeding until you're below 20. Um, and that's by that point, aplastic anemia is fairly uh, far progressed. Um, but early signs that I would consider would be a possibility would be unusual infections. Um, and uh, would be uh, just fatigue that's out of characteristic. In those circumstances, if patients are having those signs, it's very reasonable for them to see their doctors and just have a complete blood count, and that complete blood count will um, show signs uh, uh, of their counts being down, and if you catch it early, uh, then that's always great. You can avoid some of the potential complications. Dr. Pulsifer, could the hepatitis B shot cause aplastic anemia? Um, no. Uh, the hepatitis B shot is a non-live uh, virus. Um, hepatitis B vaccination will do more than anything else in the world at preventing aplastic anemia uh, because, um, especially in Asia where hepatitis V is endemic, um, if they prevented all their hepatitis B, then they wouldn't have hepatitis B associated with aplastic anemia showing up. Um, uh, the hepatitis B shot, as I mentioned, is is not a live virus. It does a very good job of, uh, of preventing hepatitis, and it has never been shown to be associated with any development of aplastic anemia. Would you say it's common for a severe aplastic anemia patient to come out of remission 10 years after treatment? Uh, it's not common. It can happen, uh, but it is not common. Okay. Are there any holistic treatments for aplastic anemia? Um, the the treatments uh, from I mean there there are a number of different alternative uh, approaches um, to aplastic anemia, and the one challenge with it is that um, uh, I am just not aware of a lot of publications uh, about them. There are some things that I very much worry about. I have seen patients treated with hypersupplementation who have ended up getting aplastic anemia. I, I would be very worried about untested supplements. One thing also that I would be very cautious about is when you have aplastic anemia and your neutrophils are very low, um, a number of kind of supplemental type approaches uh, have not had FDA type scrutiny to make sure that there aren't fungal uh, or bacterial elements uh, associated with them. Uh, and might lead to significant infection, so I'd be very cautious about them. Um, rather than, you know, uh, focusing on um, uh, uh, those type of uh, agents, I, I think as far as saying a holistic approach, the, the approach that I strongly feel is, is important is not only taking your medicines and being smart about what you eat, but eating healthy food uh, and uh, hopefully, um, you know, getting your life into a situation where uh, you're decreasing stress and doing the other types of things that really allow your body and your immune system to heal. Dr. Pulsifer, can one be duly diagnosed with multiple bone marrow failure syndromes? Um, uh, you mean as far as inherited bone marrow failure syndromes? Um, it, it's It's... Possible in in a way. So, for example, um, uh, let's say I have an inherited bone marrow failure syndrome, uh, Sanconi anemia. Um, uh, those patients can go on to develop myelodysplasia, and therefore, uh, it seems like they have two things: they have myelodysplasia, which is a bone marrow failure syndrome, and they have aplastic anemia. Excuse me, and, and they have Sanconi anemia. Um, they, in addition, could develop 
and a plastic portion uh, uh, to their inherited bone marrow syndrome as well. Um, and uh, But it's very unusual for someone who has Fanconi anemia to also have Schwachmann diamond. Um, uh, these type of cases haven't really been reported. So I, I think the way to think of it is those that have inherited marrow failure syndromes probably just have one, but then they might develop myelodysplastic syndrome and they might develop aplastic anemia. Thank you. What does it mean when, when your white count is low but the A and C is normal? So um, your white count uh, and your A and C uh, are two uh, different things with one being a portion of the first. So your total white count has more than neutrophils. It has lymphocytes, monocytes, macrophages, eosinophils. And so your white count can, it, it normally is in the range of 3,000 to uh, 10,000. And it can be um, low. It can be, say, 2,500. Your neutrophil count is not considered low until it goes below 1,500. So if you have a neutrophil count of 2,000 and a total white count of 2,200, you can have a normal neutrophil count and a low white count. You can also have a normal white count uh, and a very low neutrophil count, um, a normal white count of 3,500 with a neutrophil count of, um, uh, of 200. Uh, the thing that is more dangerous is the low neutrophil count, um, unless you have a different disease of your lymphocytes. But, um, but yeah, those things can be uh, can vary a little bit because your neutrophil count is a subset of your white count. Thank you. This question states: I was diagnosed with various severe aplastic anemia, received the horse ATG, responded after nine months, and have been on remission since April 2009. Is there any information on their likelihood for relapse? So um, uh, I assume this patient has been weaned off of their immune suppression. Um, the overall rates, if the wean has been done fairly slowly, uh, are in the range of um, uh, 15 to 20 percent. Um, uh, older data where the weans were done very quickly or stopped abruptly, the relapse rates have been in the range of 30 percent. Um, the fact that this patient finished their treatment and has now been out several years, uh, each year that goes by, the likelihood of relapse goes down. So um, it's it, it's uh, they're at a situation now where, you know, you'd guesstimate their original relapse uh, risk was in the range of uh, 20 to 30 percent, and now with uh, three years, uh, almost four having gone by, it's probably down to 10 percent or less. Thank you. Do you think clinical trials are safe for immunocompromised individuals? I think they're vital for immune-compromised individuals because um, the clinical trials that are designed specifically for them uh, do a very good job. Um, the best care that people can get is through a really high-quality clinical trial done at a high-quality center. And the reason why is that they take best practices and incorporate those into clinical trials. And what they end up doing is they have specific guidelines for how these patients should be supported and how they should be treated. Uh, over the years, we've found that patients who go on clinical trials tend to do better um, than those who don't in general. Thank you. I'm going to try to squeeze in just a couple more questions, Dr. Pulsifer. Sure. This, this patient states they've been on cyclosporine currently 100 milligrams per day for 22 years. Mm -hmm. Their bone marrow is acellular, and for the last year, the red cells and now platelets have been declining, hematocrit 8.2, platelets 120. They are 53 years old and a former college athlete. Is there anything they can do to increase their red cells? Boy, they're doing everything they can. Um, <laughs> Uh, the uh, they should um, you know if, if it's clear that the marrow is 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 you know going down and it's very low cellularity, um, there may be some uh, things that they might want to try. Um, there there are some clinical trials available through the NIH and through some other uh, a, a groups um, that they may qualify for. Um, uh, I, I don't know if they have a match donor, whether they want to consider a bone marrow transplant. Age 52 is is a 
young and healthy, I'm I'm very close to that age myself. And uh, uh, if they're in good condition and was a former college athlete, they are, they they are someone who probably could do well with a bone marrow transplant if they had a really good match. Thank you. And this will be the last question. It's in reference. Dr. Pulse referred to, I think, environmental exposures, possible environmental exposures that could lead to bone marrow failure syndromes. The question is, states that they at one time were working in a restaurant at the time of their aplastic anemia diagnosis. The one event that they can clear, clearly remember happening at that time was being exposed to smelling salts as a practical joke. Is there any research that smelling salts could trigger aplastic anemia? Um, smelling salts uh, uh, have never been associated with aplastic anemia um, that I know of, and uh, I, you know, I've read a number of different things that have looked at a number of different items, and not that I know of. Okay. Well, I would like to thank you once again, Dr. Pulsifer, for taking the time out of your schedule to present this wonderful webinar for us. And on behalf of the Aplastic Anemia and MDS International Foundation, I would like to thank each of you for joining us today and for making us your resource of choice for information on bone marrow failure diseases. If we were unable to answer your question today, please send it to us via email at help, H-E-L-P, at aamds.org so that our patient educator can respond or feel free to visit our online learning center for interviews with experts and other programs that may address your question. As a reminder, as soon as I'm done speaking, a post-event survey will appear requesting your feedback. We appreciate you taking the time to complete this survey. Again, thank you for joining us, and please remember, we, we are here to provide you with answers, support, and hope. This does conclude today's program. Thank you so very much.